the red flag flying here. Hello and welcome to Socialist Think Tank. Today I am here with Ray Goodsby. Hello, Ray. Hi, uh, good to be here. We're absolutely um, delighted to have you on to speak to us today. I'm going to go straight in with the, with the first question I usually ask people, which is, uh, what is socialism to you? Yeah, I, was, I knew you'd ask this one, because you always do. Um, I think well, it's easy to say that, oh, socialism to me means like a decent health service, housing for all, um, good wages, justice, equality. And for some parts of the world, it means sort of, you know, just access to water or to regular food, two meals a day or one meal a day, or, you know, all those things are desirable and all those, of course, I support all those things. Of course, I want all those things. But that's actually not, so for me, that's not socialism. Socialism for me is how we get those things. So socialism for me, see, I'm an old fashioned kind of guy. I, I, I see the world divided into capital and labor. You know, the people who own things and the people who work for them. Um, and socialism is not capitalism. What does that mean? That means that you have a society where the fullest, the fullest possible democracy, where we don't just get a chance to vote every five years, but we have complete, you know, we have control of, of the economy, of the money, of the resources of society, of production, so that we can actually, you know, take real decisions that affect our lives. At the moment, you know, the, 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 the state is completely dominated by rich people who, who pull all the strings, they've got their mates in the civil service, in the army, the police, and it's always run for them, you know? So we need, we need economic democracy, we need control of the economy, we need control of the, of the state in a new sort of way, so that working people can actually make the state, make the state do what they want, represent their interests, at the moment, you know, if, if you want, if you're if you're a rich guy, if you're if you're the top CEO somewhere, you don't have to you don't have to go on a march down Oxford Street. You just get on the phone to your mate in the civil service or the cabinet, and they do what you like. Or your pal who's got a peerage, and he'll he'll, he'll ask a question for you in the house. You know, the way the way the government's set up is rigged, and it's rigged in favour of the rich. And we need a, a different kind of country, and that that society where working people control, and then we can use that to do the decent schools, decent housing, <laughs> decent hospitals, a fair, just standard of living, you know, freedom from oppression for minorities and for, for women. That's, that's what we do. We use that system to achieve it. It's interesting that you mentioned freedom from oppression and, and, and a lot, of, you, you mentioned freedom a lot there. And a lot of the time there's a misconception about socialism, that it isn't about freedom, that it's about control from the top. Um, oh. what, are your yeah, what are your thoughts on that? Well, unfortunately, that that impression has been created by two different strands. I mean, you had you had the kind of a top down Labour governments who always saw that they, they just saw themselves as, as getting voted in. And, and you had this kind of like social engineering and tinkering, like the rich people trying to organise society for us, you know, telling us how we should be, you know, rather than sort of a bottom up kind of socialism, which I'm more in favour of. And of course, then you had the nightmare of, of Russia and Eastern Europe and China, you know, where no, no, no workers look at that and think, yeah, I'll have some of that. Thank you. I love to be, you know, I, I love to be uh, arrested for doing nothing and sent to prison camp for, for 10 years and, uh, and see my family ruined. No, that, that had nothing that had no appeal to working people in this country. So if, yeah, it's freedom for me, it's freedom and democracy. And it's ironic. You, you're right. Nobody thinks that, do they? You know, so when people talk about socialism, you know, they don't, the, the, unfortunately, the words that don't come to mind first are the maximum possible freedom and democracy. But that's what it is. It, it gives us the chance, all of us, gives all of us the chance to really flower because we're not looking over our shoulder at uh, economic privation and, 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 and worrying how to pay the bills or keep a roof over your head. You can really start to flourish. But to do that, we need to take on capital. We need to take on the people who are in control now. And that's, that's some people in the labor movement, they like to sort of skirt round that a little bit. You know, they think we can just kind of pass a few acts of parliament and that'll make it better. And, but no, all the while the rich have got their power, then they'll, they'll stop us ultimately from, from having a society which is just for us. And so we have to take them on, really. It's clear from your answer there that like you've you've definitely got a, a massive background in socialism. You understand socialism, and you have your very a very well developed sense of what it is and what it is to you. Wow. Have you always felt like that? Have you always been a socialist? 
well, in a sense, I mean, I I had it with breakfast. You know, it was a, I, I got socialism at the breakfast table with mum and dad. Really, I mean, my dad was a my dad was a trade unionist. We we, we I grew up in it. I was a council house kid, youngest of, youngest of six kids, council house, secondary modern school because I failed my eleven plus. In those days, if you know what the eleven plus is, if you know what that is, that exam that we had to take. So I I went to school for people who failed. That was lovely to find out when you were eleven. Um, and my dad was always a shop steward and he had a variety of jobs, but he was always a shop steward. Um, we, were, we were occasional strike. I know what it's like, <coughs> excuse me, I know what it's like to be on strike. Um, my mother and my dad, they both talked a lot about the twenties and thirties and about, you know, losing, losing work and going to the guardians for poor relief and some woman in a fur coat coming around saying, oh, Mrs. Goodspeed, how could you possibly apply for, relief from the parish when you, you know you you still got jewelry you still got a you've, you've got a sofa you know you, you know you've got some silverware in the house you know and all that kind of stuff that that sort of stuff that mum and dad like brought me up telling me these horror stories of of how bad um capitalism was and of course <laughs> i didn't know then because that was the 70s when we we're all doing quite well relatively speaking we thought we weren't but we were little did i know that like 40 years later we're heading back so just that again, where you know they won't be happy until they've got us right back in that situation. But no, I, yeah, it was from my, from my family. But I, I was a very precocious kid, you know, and so, um, so I sort of used to seek out newspapers from weird people in town squares and buy them and read them for ages. When I was like 13, 14, reading these lefty newspapers and sort of arguing with my dad about them. <laughs> whether Russia was socialist or not, and, you know, <laughs> all this sort of stuff. And um, just, you know, so I, I kind of, we, we moved from where we grew up, which was on the southern, the southern borders of London, you know, the sort of Surrey London border. Just you tell all your, your listeners in the Northeast that yes, you can be working class and live in Surrey, by the way, you know. <laughs> Life would be impossible in Surrey if you didn't, um, if you didn't have working people to service it, you know. We moved to another town, Banbury in Oxfordshire and uh, obviously there wasn't much in the way of a lefty sort of group there there's there nobody selling newspapers anywhere or there's one newspaper which are you know but um my my English teacher at school a bloke called Mr Hubbard bless him I, I don't suppose he's alive now but he was a great guy he was a guy who, 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 who saw what was in me and he sort of directed me towards George Orwell in the library you know he just directed me to all those people that would uh, and a great book called Darkness at Noon, which is all about the Stalinist sort of outrages. I think he was trying to save me from ultra leftism and Stalinism when he succeeded. And um, and so he suggested join the Labour Party. And of course, me being like 15 year old, I knew it all. Ha, ha, I can't join the Labour Party. The bunch of sellouts, you know, <laughs> they're not real socialists. So I joined the Labour Party under protest. Um, when I was 15, because I thought, yeah, like, all, like you know, I thought, well, I'm 15. I, I, I know how to solve the problems of the world. Of course, I'm 15. What, what can you possibly teach me? And, um, and I joined the Labour Party and then found, you know, fellow thinkers, fellow thinkers who had a really sensible like, view of how to, uh, how to change society. And, and it was easy in the 70s, you see, Paul, because, you know, I joined the Labour Party in June 1974. I mean, there was a revolution happening in Portugal in front of our eyes. You know, I didn't need to read books about revolutions. I just turned on the telly and there was a revolution in Portugal just happening in real time. You know, there was there was there was the, the, the struggle of, of black workers in Soweto in South Africa. You, you, you couldn't turn on the telly without, you know, there was a tragedy of Chile and, and all those people. And I, and, I, and I met I met refugees from Chile when I was when I was 15, 16 years old. And they, and they told me what they'd been through. And, you know, and you, it's a scarring, scarring and impressive um, Kind of experience and so so yeah i just was immersed in the 70s because the 70s was a, a big time i mean you had the we into discontent you had all of the, the massive numbers of strikes and and stuff and it was it was an exciting time to be a lefty i guess but of course you know we all know historically where it went um the labor government went to the imf and then started turning against its own voters and led to industrial action and then it led to thatcher and and all that and I by then I was in 77 I went to Newcastle University and I was there I lived in Newcastle for seven years I would have stayed in Newcastle really but you know any of your listeners that were in Newcastle in 1979 80 81 will, will know that 
Thatcher turned Newcastle into a ghost town. It was tumbleweed um, going through the streets. The biggest employer in Newcastle when I was there was uh, the Long Benton Dole office. There was a huge office in Long Benton, an enormous like white collar factory of a place with a mile long corridor. And, uh, and that was their only, you know, their only, uh, their job was to process um, job, job seekers allowance or whatever it was called then, uh, Dole office claims, you know. But in our YS branches in Newcastle, like nobody had a job. We had, we had really thriving YS branches. We'd, we'd go to the pub, but we, it's when we started that thing about everybody buying half a pint and making it last. You know, the whole thing about round buying was impossible because none of us had any money. So we'd, we'd, we'd get a drink. To, so we'd have a drink just so we, we weren't thrown out. But, and we'd just sort of buy a half for ourselves and buy our own, you know. <laughs> we were just sitting around, like, hugging this, this, this half, half, a, half a lager and discussing, discussing uh, about socialist politics in the pub. Um, you know, it's, uh, and obviously, you know, I, I moved in the end, I just couldn't get a job. I just couldn't get a job anywhere. I had a, I had a spell in a, as a residential social worker. I tried doing a PGCE, but I'm, I'm not made of such stern stuff as you, Paul. So I, 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 I thought that, um, teaching, teaching senior school kids just wasn't for me. <clears throat> and so in the end, we just, I just moved to London <clears throat> and, uh, I got a job. <clears throat> I got a job for two weeks as a filing clerk, Brisbane Council. That was in um, that was in March nineteen. That was in no uh, February nineteen eighty four. And um, and then in March nineteen eighty four, the miners' strike broke out. And uh, so, <laughs> on the one hand, it's a shame because I left Newcastle like two months before a national mining strike broke out, which is took me away from all that kind of. Um, mining kind of related industry but on the other hand it meant i was in london just in time for the lesbians gay support the miners which made a, a big impact on my life because of course a bit i've left out in the 70s and 80s was that i was like a closeted terrified um fearful and self-hating teenage gay bloke you know it's it's hard to express I, i've actually been doing a sort out recently of some of my old papers and just to read some of the stuff I wrote, like diaries and stuff at the time, you know, I just want to go back and give that boy a hug, you know, my God. It wasn't, it wasn't, I'd forgotten actually, even I had forgotten just how rough it was to be gay, the, the terror of that. And I, and the assumption that your family would hate you, your parents would hate you, nobody would employ you. Um, it was awful and, and worse, and you didn't like yourself either, particularly. Um, but yeah, luckily I sorted that out in Newcastle. So thank you, Newcastle, for finally the Newcastle camp, the Newcastle branch of the campaign for homosexual equality. Bless you. Um, sorted me out, um, and uh, and I and I sort of got got myself sorted out there. And I I moved, and because of that, I then in '83 I came out to my parents, which meant I could then move closer to my parents because I I wanted to stay in Newcastle away from my parents because I thought well. If I'm if I'm 300 miles away, they'll never find out my guilty secret, you know. Uh, so once I didn't have a guilty secret, I could move closer to them. And uh, my mum was fine in the end. My mum, my dad was mostly fine. My mum was really fine. My mum was kind of really, you know, she became our kind of. Um, she was like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in the end. She was like me. <laughs> she'd be me, my mum and seven seven gay blokes in a pub. She was happy with that. She was fine. But so yeah, so then was LGSM, and and that's and as as seen in the movies. So um, I'm just, I was just uh, interested a little bit there. Um, you were talking about growing up and and how you felt, and that did what what was that like to try and go away? Like, did you have to go in almost find a new family to be yourself? It's a, it's a really it's because I remember how negative that Tory government were about gay people. And I don't think the Labour Party were particularly hugely massive strides ahead of them in that area. And things have changed a lot, but it's within like, living memory for me, certainly the way gay people were treated at that time and, and lesbians. Well, in, in the seventies, it was a Labour government. Um, and no, there was, there was no assumption at all that Labour Party was pro-gay or the trade unions. I mean, there wasn't, there wasn't anybody, I mean, even the little lefty group I was in um, were not particularly pro-gay. You know, it seems strange to, I'm sure people now will, will be surprised that I was a teenager at university, heavily involved in left politics, 
but I was terrified of my comrades finding out my terrible secret. It's hard to believe now, but it was very true then. And um, and so no, we, I mean, there were, there were groups of people in the Labour Party, there's a Labour campaign for gay rights, sort of chugging along, trying to kind of nudge union conferences, nudging this CLP or that CLP. A couple of really brave people, especially in the teaching unions and, and, the, and the social worker kind of unions in those days, I think now go it was, had set up gay groups and, but to be a, to be a homosexual teacher in the seventies was, that's it, your job's finished, your career's over, you know. Um, and I just, I, I recommended you earlier today, I was telling, telling Charles about this book, which I thought I'd show, which is, it really is a really interesting book because it shows that back in the seventies, it was like, you know, union branches of the NUT and, and NALGO, um, the forerunner of Unison, who just stood up and said, no, no, we're not going to allow our, our, our colleague to be sacked for this. But even, even legal rights, I mean, you could, there was a guy in Scotland who, um, he was sacked as a handyman on a children's sort of camp thing. He's a member of the EIS, which is the Scottish Teachers Union. Um, and he was sacked because the, the, the employers thought he might put off people, you know, and so the and it went to an employment tribunal and he lost he lost because um be, because it said we, we, the, the employment tribunal accepted he was no danger to children <laughs> which is just asking the question is just demeaning and insulting but anyway he was accepted that a gay man isn't a danger to children but the employer could have a reasonable expectation that parents would think he was and therefore they're they therefore they were okay to sack him and so he that was it he sacked john saunders sacks lost his job that's the end of that, really. And by the way, it, homosexuality wasn't even legal in Scotland until 1980. It shows how far things have, have developed since then. And I think that's probably in no small part down to a lot of what you did with lesbian and gay support the minors. So um, that I'd, came be, on, I'd, yeah. be interest, I'd be interested to find out, um, you know, we've most of most of the people I know have watched the film Pride and, and take like just it, it's the feel good movie of that particular year wasn't it it was so like obviously it's heartwarming and then gutting at the same time there are so many ups and downs in it but generally the feeling is of hope what did it feel like to be to be part of that and how did it come about and what and what role did you play um, well, the strike started in March, but it didn't, LGSM didn't actually get going until um, July um, because, yeah, that was the pride thing. We, we all met the pride. I mean, there were odd, most people involved in setting up LGSM were already involved in the labour movement. One, one, one wasn't, 11 men set it up in Mark Ashton's council flat in Yellowfin and Castle in London, which is shown in the opening sections of the movie. Um, and so we met in his council flat and we and we set up this group and we said, oh, well, well OK, we need to collect money for the miners. We're, we're all collecting money for the miners anyway and street collections in our trade union branches, but nothing about gay people specifically. Um, so obviously we were all gay, but some of us were out. I mean, interestingly, I wasn't even I wasn't out at work at that stage. <laughs> nobody, nobody at work knew I was gay, bizarrely. But um, but I was out doing the LGSM stuff like in my spare time. Um, and, and we thought, well, look, it's just an extension. We just saw it as very, a very small scale thing, an extension of that. We'll just collect some money, send it off. You know, let's see what happens. You know, it'd be good that there's, 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 we had a, somebody had a collection on the Gay Pride March in the end of June, uh, 1984. And they were surprised by the response. They got quite a much bigger collection than they thought. And they got like a, a real wave of, of, of goodwill from people, which we didn't necessarily expect either. We thought, hang on, that, that's going to be interesting. So, um, so then they, uh, a couple of weeks after that, they, they put an advert in Capital Gay and I saw the advert and a few friends of mine did. And we turned up at the council flat and we set up, set up LGSN. And we thought, well, that's okay. You know, now who do you give it to? <laughs> now in the film, it says the NUM refused the money and they, you know, they kept, they wouldn't phone back and all that stuff. That's, that's all nonsense, I'm afraid to say. Um, the NUM couldn't take the money because the NUM's funds were sequestered anyway. And so any money that was sent to the NUM would have been seized. Um, and so there was no, there's no point sending it to the NUM. So, so all over the country, people set up twinning, uh, twinning agreements with, between particular groups of supporters and particular pits. And one of our members, um, actually sort of through a friend of a friend in the Communist Party in South Wales, I think it was in the end, had, had connections with another person in South Wales. And we, we just, oh, well, why not? 
we'll give it to Delice, you know. And a group called um, Gay YS had already given a, a money to Delice. And so when we thought, well, okay, we've got this link with this one, this one valley in South Wales full of sheep and coal mines, <laughs> a Welsh speaking valley, mind you, as just a, another layer of, um, of difference. It's just as if it wasn't enough. So a Welsh speaking sheep riven, <laughs> very rural mining community. Um, and so we thought, well, we'll go there then. And we wrote a letter thinking, well, yeah, we'll never get a reply to this. We just said, here's the money. We thought we'd get like a thank you. Thank you for your money. Now, bugger off, you know. Um, but in the end, they, they sent somebody to meet us, as is shown in the movie. They sent Dyer to meet us and we met him. And he did speak at the Bell nightclub just opposite King's Cross Station. And they stopped the disco and stuck him on stage. You know, it wasn't a drag pub, actually. That was the thing. But they stuck him on stage in this disco. It was like alternative. We were, it's the sort of gay pub where we used to dance to the Smiths instead of, instead of high energy, you know. It's all very sort of like a bit gothy and a bit alternative. Uh, full of people with not much money. And so we stuck him on stage and he got a fantastic reception. And we, and we, were, think, we were thinking, hang on, this is getting good now. The response we're getting is much better than we thought, you know. And so we thought, well, okay, we'll carry on. And, uh, and we sort of met regularly and more and more people joined us. I mean, we, we, we started off as a, as a group of lefties, really. Uh, Mark was in the Communist Party. I was like a, a trot. I was a trot inside the Labour Party. So you can fill in your own blanks uh, in, 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 in 1984. Um, and, but then, we, yeah, as we collected in pubs and stuff, more people came in and joined us. And, they just, and so we had all sorts of people who'd not really involved in politics before. Even, even the original group, they were not really died in the wool lefties. They were just, you know, friends of people who were active. And we just dragged their friends in, and, you know. And it was, a, it was an interesting group of guys. It was all men, first of all, but then women eventually joined, but only in relatively small numbers. That was a problem we had all the way through. And um, yeah, we, and we managed to recruit kind of quite a lot of rough diamonds. You know, there were some, there were some guys there who'd seen the, the rougher end of, uh, of working class life, certainly back in, and it, cause it all come to London from somewhere else in the main. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Londoner and a few others were, but you know, Mark's from Northern Ireland people from Scotland, people from Liverpool, people from uh, Mike Jackson was from Ashington in Lancashire. People had come to London to sort of save themselves, you know, uh, and to, to, to form this family, as you said. Um, and so we had an interesting gang of working class blokes there. Uh, and then, then we, we recruited just other, other, some lefties, some more lefties, some different groups, different left groups decided to join and take part. And then lots of completely non-political people, people who just thought the miners were being treated badly and we need to help them, you know? And so, so we did. Uh, we just carried on collecting. We had a rule, which is, uh, you know, you, you, you can't speak or do anything in a meeting if you haven't collected any money, which is always a nice rule. It was, uh, it was um, you know, do the stuff first before you, before you, you know, shoot off your gob, really. You've got to collect some money as well as anything else you do. Um, it's a bit we, different from some of my experiences where you have to get permission before you even ask for anything, you know? So uh, I like that proactive way of doing things. Sorry to interrupt yeah, there, but that's I mean, a... Well, we were a single issue campaign. I mean, we had, it was a tricky, I mean, look, we had a, we had, we had a room full between like 30, 20, 25, 30, 40 common lefties. I mean, we didn't all meet in Gaze the Word. There's nothing. Gaze the Word very quickly became too small for us. We had regular weekly Sunday meetings of like 30, 35, 40 people. Because we had to, we had a top room of a pub called the Fallen Angel in Islington. And we had to meet in their top room. Uh, all sitting on the floor, you know, like uh, just sort of trying to go through planning our collections. Because of course there was no, there was, there was no mobile phones. There was no email. You know, I think, I sometimes hear a gasp when people watch the movie Pride and people say, oh, we, you know, let's contact Bromley. We can't, we can't contact him. He lives at home. You know, it's like he hasn't, oh, people, I can imagine, I can hear young people in yours go, we'll just phone his mobile. And you think, no, 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 nobody had a mobile then. Nobody had an email. You know, if you were locked inside your house, there's no way of contacting. And so, you know, we had to type up the minutes. Mike Jackson, you should type, collect all the money and type up the minutes and then duplicate them on a, duplicating machine like turning the handle and then cycle around London delivering them to people um, 
so we all knew where we had to collect for that following week and then we'd meet the next Sunday and do it all again. So we had to sit there and plan out all of these discussions and all, all of these collections. Um, very sort of action oriented. But of course, well, the point I'm coming to, it was a, a huge mixture, just that every lesbian and gay lefty in London was sort of in there eventually. And of course it, became, it could become, it threatened to become like a bonfire of sectarian kind of, tactics you know like who's going to dominate it who's going to get their line accepted so although some of that was enjoyable some people didn't enjoy it some people did but we had to be very strict like, okay look we're here to collect money for the miners so all the other opinions you might have you can have those opinions we can chat about it in the meeting we can chat about it in the pub but really we're here just for the miners you know it was we were focused on them our support for the miners was unconditional if they we are people often say what would you have done if they just said you know go away, you know, go forth and multiply. And we would have carried on collecting for them anyway, because we didn't expect, we expected them to say, well, thanks for the money, but we don't want anything to do with you because you're queer, basically. <laughs> you know, we, we don't want to embarrass ourselves by meeting you, but thanks for the money. But then we met, we met Di, and then we got an invitation through from the committee, like, come and meet us, come and, come and stay. And we were just amazed. We were, we were getting a, we were getting a, what can I say? We were getting a warm invitation from a working class community that many of us would not have got from our own families. And that was extraordinary, really. And when we went down there in three minibuses, by the way, and there's 27 of us, not like 10 people in one minibus singing, every woman's a lesbian at heart. But we, we, you know, we, we had, we went down in three minibus fulls and we were all, you know, we, unfortunately we arrived very late because the lice is not an easy place to find. It really, really isn't. Um, and, you know, it's, we, we got there at one o'clock in the morning. And so we did have places to stay, but we all had to just, many of us we did actually spend that first night on Di Donovan's floor. But then the following night we were billeted properly, you know, with our people. And, uh, and then we had the social and everything. And it was, it was we, we went there and we, we delegated somebody to do our little speech. And in the movie, again, to build up the dramatic tension, because they have to have some kind of move from, from, from bad to good. So they have to exaggerate how bad it was in order to make the good stuff happen, you know? But no, we, we, turned, up in the, we turned up in the hall and, and we just got a round of applause. People just stood up and, and had a round of applause. And it was like, it was a very, very emotional event because we just couldn't believe. We couldn't believe that a mining village presented with 27 queers and, and dykes as we called ourselves at the time, well, or puffs and dykes. And we looked like we were puffs and dykes as well. You know, we, we, that's, we, that's, we looked like what we were, you know, and we acted like what we were, you know, we didn't take any prisoners. And they just, that was fine. And, and it melted away. And of course, you know, we had interesting and weird conversations in, over, over pints and where sort of very shy, tentative questions were asked, probing, you know, but people were fine. You know, I'm not sure if anybody did actually ask who does the housework, but um, um, but but you know, it was it was great, and and then we we you know I stayed in I stayed with his family, and um, and again we we chatted into the early hours, and um, and then you know we did go around all visiting the castles like it like in the movie, and we just came back, of course, absolutely fired up. I mean, you know, it was like Mike Jackson often is he's often quoted saying he said going to Delice was like coming home because many of us had come from working class communities. I don't want to say that every member of LGSM was like a working class guy, because they weren't, but many of us were. And it was just nice to be sort of welcomed into the bosom of that kind of warmth embrace by a group of people who needed us, but who were genuinely friendly and genuinely accepting. Um, so when, when we came back, of course, we'd have, you know, we'd have done anything, but we'd have laid down our lives for the miners after that. And, um, and we just went for, once both people heard about this, we publicized it and people were amazed because, you know, people were saying to us, oh, well, you're collecting money, but I bet they want to meet you. I bet they, I bet they don't support you. You know, I bet you'll go down there and then you'll see what they're really like, you know, and they were great. And we, and we had a lovely time and we came back and we went hell for leather in organizing the benefit, which is shown the, the pits and perverts benefit. And we went on and on. Um, I must correct something else in the film, just, just to, on the subject of where the film differs on important stuff. They never voted not to take our money. That's a fiction. That's complete fiction in the movie. 
um, we were, in fact, we, our, our, another visit we had coincided with the weekend they voted to go back. So we were there on the Sunday and they went back on the Monday, I think it was, or the Tuesday. And so we were there when the, when, when the announcement was made that they voted to go back, we were there in South Wales and we were there like weeping and wailing and punching the wall and people were getting really emotional because some people thought it was a sellout. Some people thought, well, what can we do? You know, some people were despondent. Some people were angry. Some people were just sobbing. Um, yeah. And then I came home and I watched the return to, to work on telly. And I cried like a baby. I don't mind telling you. I just cried and cried and cried. In fact, I can't talk about it now <laughs> without, without, um, I can't. I, anyway, yeah, it was a very emotional time. Um, and then, of course, I mean, that was in like March, March, April, May, June, you know, three or four months later, they did. We knew they were coming, of course, the film's teasing. We knew they were coming on the demo. Um, that was, they didn't just turn up and surprise us. We'd already, we'd arranged it. They had places to stay, you know. But yeah, they turned up and we did lead the march. And um, and that just, the, the effect that had on the on the people on the march and people watching the march, because in those days, of course, a lot of gay people would watch it. They didn't quite have the nerve to go on it, you know. To go on a gay, to go on a gay pride march then was like to risk, risk things in your life. But they, they watched it and sort of like, mm, it's interesting, you know, like sort of like half-heartedly kind of cheering, but scared them might be seen but um but yeah we we were proudly marching along and uh and that was it that's that's the fact we had and of course then it, it, the film makes it clear i mean it's a, it's a comment so i don't want to like go on and on but the uh we that had an effect it had an immediate effect on the on the tuc conference and then the labor party conference that year where finally these promotions were passed now i don't want to pretend that passing those gay rights motions that was it we'd won because you know the leader of the Labour Party, Neil Kinnock, was not an ally at all. The right wing, you'd, you'd never believe it to hear them now. You would never believe the right wingers now. You'd think they'd invented gay rights, but they opposed us tooth and nail then. Anybody who, anybody who pretends that, that the right of the Labour Party were the people pushing gay rights in the 80s need their head examined. They wanted to distance themselves from us because we, they saw us as vote losing. They saw us as embarrassing, the loony left. You know, these, one, of these, one of these issues we don't want to mention. Um, uh, and that was part of their attack on Livingston as well, who's one of the few Labour leaders who did solidly support us. And of course, Jeremy Corbyn supported us all the way through. And Tony Benn did. And the left in general did, you know. So, yeah, you know, let's just be clear here. The, the, the gay rights people in the Labour Party have always been at the left, you know. So don't take any old nonsense from those sort of right wing gay MPs. That's, you know, their fellow thinkers a couple of a generation ago were nowhere to be seen and actively opposing us. That, um, that brings me to a point I noticed in the film and, and watching watching Pride and we watched it again this week because uh, we generally do every couple of months anyway, <laughs> just because we need to <laughs> 42 and, times though, have you? Uh, not, not 42 yet. I'm, I'm, I'm getting there. But, <laughs> but um, so... What I noticed in uh, you sent me a film um, of Dancing in Delice, which is yeah. um, which is the real sort of documentary of it. And yeah, we made it ourselves. Was, yeah, yeah, it, and it's a it's brilliant. And YouTube just uh, just YouTube that and have a look at it. I recommend anyone to watch it because it's it's real, it's it's raw, it's gritty, and it, it's one of the powerful things about it that is very different from the film I noticed was that um, every single speech almost mentioned socialism it mentioned oh, yeah. they were socialists as well as being gay and as well as being minors and it was victory to socialism so the there's the the famous scene where it's a victory to the minors victory for gays victory for lesbians and, and but you were saying victory for socialism and i know yeah, jimmy Summers old, said that as well sick, and victory for the working class yeah and victory for socialism yeah and even jimmy somerville who was obviously a lefty he was mark cashton's best mate but uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was obviously we were explicit. There's no there's no pretending that we were some non political. I mean, the film presents us as a bunch of quite naive, beautiful young people <laughs> um, um, who are just oh hey why don't we support the miners and oh where's the coal field oh look you know you know we all knew where the coal field was. Many of us were born in them. You know 
we knew exactly where the coal fields were. We know we knew where you know, we had links in the labor movement in those areas and we, we planned it properly, you know. Um, so we weren't as stupid or as beautiful as the film makes out. Um, although I always like to, but I'm, there's, there's nobody called Ray Goodspeed in the movie. And I like to, I like to put the idea around that they couldn't find an actor good looking enough for me. You know, all the really good looking actors were booked so they couldn't include me in the movie. No, but even the, one, even the names that are used, their characters are nothing like them. Like Gethin and Jonathan did not own Gay's the Word. They did not live above the shop. Um, they've never been a couple. <laughs> Jonathan had a boyfriend then, and he's got the same boyfriend now, 30, 40 years later. Um, it's a lot of that. And the whole character of Joe, of course, is invented and stuff. So even the people who, whose names are used are not really them, with the exception, really, of Mark Ashton and Mike Jackson. They're, they're really like the real people. You know, they're, they're themselves, but all the other characters kind of, they tried to squidge like 30 or 40 people into nine characters or however many there are. I think I'd know after 40 times, we'd have never counted them, but anyway. So they, 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 they conflated, they had little bits of people's character in all of these few characters, the few characters they sort of invented, uh, including the, the token dyke. We had, we had, um, we had, uh, sort of, I suppose we had, uh, up to 10 lesbians in a group of like 50, 50 people. It was always a, it was always an issue getting women to get involved in a joint campaign of that, of that kind. But, and eventually of course they, some of, some of the women, not all of them, but some of them just formed lesbians against pit closures. And fine, you know, looking back, I can say fine. We, we mocked them a bit at the time as the film makes clear, you know, which I'm not proud of, but you know, looking back, good. They did good work, fine. I suppose the question that would be asked would be, why was socialism? Why, why do you think that was left out of the film? Because there's obviously there are film narratives to go on. There's always a narrative around a film and any film that's based on a true story has fictional yeah. elements and truthful elements. And, you know, they take liberties and, and uh, they, they try to tell a story in the right way. And that's fine. That's good. We well, that. I mean, the thing is, I mean, OK, um, they don't mention socialism, but we knew Oddly enough, this is the opposite point to the one I was scared of. When, when we all had our initial, they, they tracked us all down. Stephen Beres was a scriptwriter, tracked us all down individually, and he took us out for cups of coffee and cake and interviewed us and just took notes. And on, on, he sort of composited all of our different interview notes and he constructed the script that we hadn't seen. We had no idea of the script and we had no, no part in making the film other than we do appear as extras. I don't know if you notice me as an extra, but, but I'm, in, I'm in the film, in the, in the scene going across the bridge. At the end of the movie um and so, so we had no idea of what the film was going to be and we, we had a secret pre-showing of it obviously because because you know if the miners in south wales and us in london if we hated the movie it would have been a disaster so so they showed it to us and i expected it because we knew it was going to be a comedy drama we knew they were, they were aiming for like a, a, a heartwarming mass audience Kind of like a rom com, but not love. It was like between two communities instead of two people. You know, it's like you know, miners, miners, miners meet gays, boy meets girl. They fall out. They fall. In, they're in love. They fall out of love. They get together at the end. Everyone's happy. So I expected it to be completely non political, and I was a bit and a bit um, um, a bit nervous about that, a bit apprehensive. But to be honest, it's more political than I thought <coughs> because. They don't talk about socialism, they don't mention the word socialism. But every, every scene and breath of the film lives socialism. You know, working class solidarity, fighting the bosses, you know, fighting Thatcher. Thatcher's the demon, she's a hate figure in the movie, and that's, you know. So if they had a film full of the word socialism, it would not go down well in Kansas. You would not show the film in Texas if it was explicitly a socialist movie, you know. And so, you know, you can say we're sold out. But the thing is, by, by making this sort of film, which is a fictional comedy drama and a very funny comedy drama, it got a, a wider audience of the story that we thought would never be told. And yeah, you could have got Ken Loach to make it, I guess. You could have got, um, you could have got, you made a much more truthful film, true, true to life. But I think making it a big kind of blockbuster that it turned into, I think just got, it got us views all over the world. There are people in Japan and Korea and Australia and India and 
all over Europe and Argentina, Canada, everyone is writing in saying, wow, this film's fantastic, where can we find? And of course, then they just Google it and find the real story. And, um, and they're happy with it. I mean, they find out the truth. You just got onto Google and there's something by me or Mike or dozens of other people who are the real story and they, and they got the real story. And they, they, you can look at the miners, the real miners on, on Google, just find out who they are, see what the differences were. People will watch this now and I'll, I'm, I'm outlining the differences again. But no, I mean, I think when Mark's make, making a speech, somebody shouts, commie, from the back of the hall, I think. Um, and he was, he was, a, he was a member of the Communist Party at the time. Um, but you know, where, where I was pleasantly surprised how political it was, and I thought, oh God, it's not going to sell. People aren't going to, people aren't going to sell. They're not going to go and see this because it's too, it's too political. But actually, they did. It was fine, and and it made money for the studios, and they were happy. And uh, and we got this fantastic story told. It was, I think, it, it was I think it was shown on beat by the BBC on Boxing Day one year, which is extraordinary for a group about a, from a group of homosexuals supporting a failed industrial dispute <laughs> just you would think hmm yeah that's not really block blockbuster it's not box office hit is it really but it, it worked somehow yeah so i think it's really clear that to anyone who's a socialist that it is a socialist story and i think you're absolutely mm. right we need to just explain that to people you know some people well you know your favorite film that you keep on ranting on about that's a socialism story and, and that normalization of socialism, which we're trying to get across that we're actually trying to fight for something positive for people, just like you do in that movie. And you were villainized in many, in many um, aspects of life, both the minors and lesbians and gays support the minors and, and well, yeah. lesbians and gays in general. Um, I mean, the minors were the heroes of it. I mean, you know, I've, I've been uncomfortable. Some of the sort of publicity goes out, you know, you, you, you people describing LGSM as heroes. I mean, no, that's absurd. All we did, we stood outside pubs and collected money. That's not heroic. Um, we just did something. What was heroic was the miners taking on the Thatcher's government in the first place. You know, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk to a member of Sedgefield CLP and say that, the, the, you know, we were the heroes. The miners are the heroes. They, 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 how they stuck it for a year, I, I will never know. How they went through that and came through the other side, I just don't know. Um, and of course, the miners specifically in Delight, they were heroes for actually extending the hand of friendship to us. We, we sent them that money. And what was heroic was not us sending the money. What was heroic is the response we got. So, yeah, OK, come and visit us. That just amazed us all. And it's, it will never cease to amaze me, really. You know, I mean, in a situation where we were being demonised as like carriers of gay plague, bringing death upon ourselves, you know, living in a sewer of our own making, you know, with, with every national newspaper saying how filthy, disgusting, dis, you know, ridiculous and dangerous we were, perverts, spreading disease. It was like the, every newspaper was full of this stuff. And in that situation, to invite us all to come and stay and sleep in your spare bedroom, it's just, it's, it was just extraordinary, really, and, uh, and will never be forgotten. And so I'm, you know, we're in contact with those people and we always will be. We're, we'll always stay in contact with the people in Delight. Well, it's, it's Delice, Neath, and Swansea Valleys. It's not just Delice. People get annoyed with that, but it's just, you know. Other, other towns. It wasn't just on Cloyne. It was Ustrudgen Lice as well. Shout out to Ustrudgen Lice and Seven Sisters and Colbren and Banwen and all those papers. It wasn't just, wasn't just on Cloyne. Um, so now I'm going to ask you a little bit about um, the TUC then, because you, you mentioned the book by, and, and wasn't he the first? Um, Peter Purton, yeah. Yeah, he was. What, what was his title in the TUC? He was certainly. The he was the LGBT one. officer for the GUC for for eighteen years. Yeah, and, and, he, and covered, he was the first he one appointed. He covered disabled things as well, but I suppose they only had money for one job. So the film makes it pretty clear that um, the NUM block vote helped get that through at Labour Party conference, mm. and that's a it's a big change. And we, it's it's interesting. We um we've spoken to a few people involved with the M NUM, including the the current uh, general secretary. Alan Marge, sorry, not NUM, the, Dur uh, the Durham Miners Association, uh, but he was in the NUM and so on. And, oh. uh, and the support for all different communities, I think there's something that, that is in the miners who were involved in that trade union action that is just a deep solidarity for every other group that is ever put under pressure by the government. Do you think that was, that was a real game changer with regards to the to the TUC 
and uh, the NUM and, and also, did that change the way this country is run? Did that improve things for everyone? Well, it didn't change the country because we were out of power till 97. Um, and I mean, when Blair was in, he had to, as the book tells the story, when Blair did come to power in 97, it was the unions were pushing him, pushing and pushing and pushing to extend the rights at work. You know, he didn't want to do that in 70 people, you know, uh, and, 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 and it, he had to be kind of pushed into this. He was very nervous of gay rights stuff. So, you know, a lot of the a lot of the the unions had. Well, let's go back a bit. Yes, it did help because it, if, the, if the NUM support gay rights I and mean, you couldn't imagine a more sort of a butcher kind of union, it was like, you know, it was the only union where where women couldn't even join it, really, or, or very few women. Some of them, the surface workers maybe could have done but overwhelmingly male union. Um, and the other unions just thought, well, you know, how can we not vote for it if the miners are in favour? <laughs> it, it just seemed ridiculous, you know, that if the miners aren't scared of a bunch of pansy boys, um, then how can we be scared of a bunch of pansy boys? It just makes us look ridiculous. Um, and it wasn't just that. I mean, even at the uh, Young Socialist Conference in 1984, 1985, Loads and loads of young miners were recruited to the Young Socialists during those years, and they they I went to the conference, and they were they were loads of gangs of my, young miners, 18, 19, 20 year old miners, who were just kind of you know being treated and 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 and, and, have, and larging up at uh, conference and in the discos and the sort of uh, and the parties after, and they talked to us, and they were fine, you know, hey, let's get you a drink, Whoa, you know, sort of, they were perfectly happy and and fine with us as well, and uh, and 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 it, that feeling. Even our badges now, our, our badges are like collector's items. If you go on any sort of miners uh, Facebook pages, there are people there that are desperate to get copies of our original enamel badge that we did. But they go, they're going for a tidy sum on, on eBay, apparently. Um, but you see, OK, so they, they passed the motions. Now, the Labour Party, nothing could really happen until until Blair came in and, it, and he gradually um, Passed those equality motions, got rid of the most oppressive laws, laws on soliciting, because it because people don't realise it, it was illegal to ask anybody. It wasn't illegal to be gay, but it was illegal to ask anybody to have sex with you. Because if if you if you if you propositioned anybody, then then you were it was it was classed as soliciting for an immoral purpose, and they got you under the prostitution laws. So if you somehow magically locked brains and went off to a locked room, you could have sex. But if you if you said to a bloke in the street or outside a pub or in a pub, like what about it then? The, the chances are, especially outside a pub, that bloke was going to be a policeman and he'll arrest you just for that. They used to send in pretty policemen, as we call them, um, to just la you know, lurk around toilets and outside pubs just to, to catch us on soliciting for an immoral purpose. And so Blair Blair eventually swept away a lot of that. But between between the minor strike and Blair, you had this whole um time of, of you had the AIDS stuff which is just making life miserable you had uh, although it also gave us a certain visibility which kind of paradoxically helped to spread understanding I think um, but then you had the section 28 stuff to clamp down on labor councils who were trying to introduce stuff so you had that that section 28 all through the 90s um, there wasn't a, the uh, there was an the the, the, the um, there was the bill which reduced the age of consent in the early 90s, introduced by a Tory, incidentally, and opposed by some Labour MPs. You know who you are, David Blunkett. So there are there are there was about I think probably about 20 Labour MPs who voted against an equal age of consent in uh, in 19, 1994, I think it was. Can't be sure of the year. And so they settled for 18 rather than rather than 16. Um, but with the trade union side, this is the important thing because the trade unions had it. And so other unions now had the green light from the TUC and they, they just looked at workplace issues. Like the, the transport unions looked at getting free travel for your gay partner, looking at pension schemes, looking at the, the right to inherit your, to inherit your, your, your partner's pension rights. Um, you know, people who are, who are sacked or victimized for being gay at work were then supported by their trade union. And it, and it chipped away year by year by year and as lesbian and gay slowly transmogrified into lesbian gay bisexual and trans it changed itself but and 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 so people overlook that that 
that daily, in, see, we spend most of our life at work. And so if you've got that chipping away, gradual chipping away by trade unions, where it's, it's accepted by trade unionists that you can't be picked on or discriminated against because you're gay, that changes public opinion. Because it's like in every kind of community, there's, 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 there's trade unions sort of beavering away, protecting the interests. Now, of course, were all trade unions pro gay? No, I'm sure there was all sorts of terrible, terrible anti-gay stuff from trade unions as well. But this story really needs to be told. You know, Peter's done a really good job of telling it, and uh, and, and I recommend the book. Um, also, it gets rid of that idea that somehow working class people are kind of naturally anti-gay. You know, we, we, the, the right wing and the, the centrists and the Guardianistas they love presenting this this fiction that the, the working class is like, you know, automatically sexist, racist, and homophobic. Which is that's not my experience. And okay, you'd expect me to say that because I'm a lefty, but it's really genuinely not my experience. If you want to hear racism, go to a suburban golf club. You know, go to a go to the go to a golf club with the Farages and their signet rings and their and their gold chains. You know, there that's that's where you're going to get the the racism from. I mean, look at London. There's barely a couple where which was mixed race. I mean, the London working class, every other couple you see is black and white united together. There isn't that sense of, uh, of automatic hatred of, of, of black people in, uh, in in the cities. Of course, there are communities there are communities in in, in England where <coughs> the racism is stronger. But there's no I, I haven't found working class people to be automatically anti-gay either. There's a sort of a they haven't got all the fancy talk around it, but but there's a rough and ready kind of acceptance of it. Uh, whereas a lot of middle class people could be clever with the language, but sort of secretly hate you anyway. And I've got a radar for that. I can see straight through that. That's a, that's a useful radar to have. Um, so um, we've spoken about all that, and that's really, really brilliant stuff and so exciting. And I've realised I haven't really updated you. So what have you been doing since, you know, since all that? Because that's a, some, something that defines you in that way is a brilliant thing to be defined by because, um, you know, they made a film about it. Not very many people get a film made out, made out of something they've done. But what have you done since then? Because I'm sure that you've uh, you've remained active. Yeah, well, I'm, as I say, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm an extra in a film of my own life. It sounds a very profound thing to say. It sounds like some sort of existential thing, you know. Um, but uh, I'm I took a break, honestly. Um, by 1992, after after the minor strike, I, I was involved in not other lesbian game. I, Everything I've been involved in has always been trying to bring the labour movement and gay people together. You know, I, I, I think that's the that's the way forward for, for achieving gay rights. I mean, the, the place gay people should be in a union. They should be in the labour movement. That's where they're going to find. And they need to fight. They need to fight for their place there. They need to <clears throat> they need to fight for their right to be in there. And they need to fight for the movement to take up their specific issues as well. And so they need to organise themselves and need to be part of the labour movement. But ultimately, they need to join in the labor movement. They need to, you know, because people talk about intersectionality, like, that it can be sometimes used to sort of split people off into smaller and smaller subsections. And once you've done all that and you've examined your own issues, then you have to come back. And the film goes on and on, probably a bit too often, actually, about the, the shaking hands thing, this image of the shaking hand in the Pride movie. And I think, you know, that's, that's important. And I think a lot of stuff I've done is trying to keep that contact between between the labor movement and, and gay people. So I was involved in the trade unions against Clause 28, specifically trade unionists against Clause 28. And I was involved in that campaign. And da -da -da. But by 92, I was burned. I'd been at it since I was a 15 year old schoolboy, you know, almost without stop. And I was, I was burned really. Um, and so in the, the 90s and the noughties weren't good for me. I just kind of, I did a bit of political wandering, you know, this 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 party. I was in the Green Party for a couple of years in the early nineties, but I just sort of fed up with it. And I and um, but of course the good thing about it is my 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 first sort of when I first came into left wing politics, it was to do with the seventies and that big upsurge of working class militancy. Then I went to sleep a bit, really truthfully, can't can't tell a lie. Um, and it was the crash again in two thousand and seven and two thousand eight again, which just I thought. OK, I kind of made my peace with capital for a few years, but no, this I cannot tolerate this now. You know, I, I cannot die 
without having done my bit to end this system. I cannot allow this injustice to continue. And it's actually stronger. I'm stronger now by virtue of having the break because, you know, when you first join in, you're a youngster, you, you're, half of you just looking for friends, you're just trying to fit in with people. You sort of, you go along with it, you understand it, you educate yourself, but you know, but having a break and coming back to it in middle age or elderly, middle age, let's be kind. Um, I was much more sure. You know, I was eyes open. I'd thought it all through and I was I knew what I was doing this time when I came back in. Um, and so, yeah, I'm involved in uh, the Labour Party again. I, I rejoined the Labour Party in 2015, like many people did. Um, I've been gone out of the Labour Party for a while before that. Um, I'm chair of my local Labour Party now in a, in a, in a, which is nice. You know, yes, I'm a gay bloke, but I'm just chair of the Labour Party. That's, that's, you can do that now. You don't have to be the gay chair of the Labour Party. You're just the chair of the Labour Party. It's, it's great now that the Labour movement being gay is just actually kind of not very interesting anymore, which is as it should be. Um, but we do lots of good work. We, our, our Labour Party does some really good work on local unions, supporting people in industrial disputes, raising money, raising sometimes thousands of pounds for disputes for hospital cleaners. We did a lot of work with. Um, we, we were regular on picket lines. We organised a conference recently on Zoom for trade unionists. We became, we sort of, it's like a trade union forum for trade unionists in Waltham Forest Borough in East London, trying to get them. That wasn't me, but that was organised by one of my other members, but it was, it was part of that whole process. And that's what our CLP does. Yeah, we are, we became a focus for, for organising trade unions locally against the coming destruction of jobs, you know, because unemployment's going to double, triple, uh, all over Britain and we need to prepare our response to that as a, as a party and as, as a trade union movement so I'm involved in that stuff um, it's good I think trade unions after going through decades of being bashed I think trade unions now are really sort of it, it's still the seeds of it the little kind of snowdrops poking up through the snow you know it's just like little bits of it little shoots and you can see unusual groups of people like some of the new unions like the IWW or the United Voices of the World or the Independent Workers of Great Britain are doing work organizing organizing groups that have never been organized before and it's a bit like going back to the 1880s if anybody's a bit of a historian on your site you know the match girls and the and the dockers strikes you know where all of a sudden workers who are not kind of skilled craftsmen all of a sudden started getting organized you know uh, and I think we've, you've got an increase in union membership generally, and you've got an increase in union membership of people who've never been organised before. And I'm involved in the IWW, particularly organising workers in where I used to work 15 years, which is um, English teachers, in, people who teach English as a foreign language, which is, I, I went to Moscow for two years and lived there, which we didn't get time to talk about, but I lived in Moscow for two years teaching English. And um, and so I, I'm involved in, and I just, recently won an employment tribunal for 15 members of staff from the IWW. We haven't got the money yet because they might just go bust instead. And so we might never see the money, but we've got the judgment. And that was a, that was a case involving um, fake self-employment. So that was good to get that. Um, oh, what else? Um, that stuff, I'm, I'm involved. I'm, I'm in the Labour Party. So I'm involved now. I've sort of... Um, I've bumped into a group of, 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 of old lefties that I, that I knew 40 years ago, and they're organised around a, a little website, a little website called uh, Left Horizons. And so I, I do some work with them. It's a nice little lefty website. We're not, we're not saying, oh, you know, we're the only true leaders of the proletariat or the working class. We're just saying, look, guys, we agree with each other. You know, here's, we, let's put some articles out, see if you agree with us, you know, exchange some views. If you do agree with us, come on board, you know. Uh, let's do let's do some work together so that, that's a useful little thing i found another kind of little group of people um people that i knew that i met actually in the 70s in newcastle actually and now they now yeah that, that I've, I've re i've sort of re um rejoined them I've, I've sort of tied that knot again with people that i the lefties in newcastle that I, that I that i i met in the 70s i'm sort of back there with a few of them and that's nice um so that's good so yeah, that's it. That's what I'm up to. I mean, Unite Community as well, because uh, I'm retired gentleman, so I can do that. I took early retirement from, from, from TEFL teaching. So that's what I'm up to. That's where I am. Um, Still making a difference then with that, 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 that story about uh, the, the tribunal. 
a real win there, and it's those wins that really well, keep people going. It is, but, but the trouble is the laws the laws against you. So if the, if the if the company goes bust, we won't get we, we may not get the money. That's the truth of it. Um, but you know, it's like somebody somebody says need. somebody says to Mark Ashton character in the movie, "I'm still changing the world, Mark," and he just says, "Well, bit by bit, you know." And what can you do? You do your bit, don't you? You do what you can. Um, they're since coming back to the left in sort of around the time of the crash. I'm just doing my bit. You know, what can you do? I'm just I, I'm doing. We're doing what we can to uh, to fight back. Now, you know, I think. Okay, the left is is out of power in the Labour Party now, but it's it's not it's not the early nineties again. I don't think I don't think we need to be despondent. I mean, I was despondent in nineteen ninety two because there was an ideology in the country in which in which the left just seemed to be completely discredited. There was there was there was almost no left in the country. Um, trade unions were being bashed. Left people, left wing people were like losing heart, um, and it seemed also that. That the kind of reform, it's the odd little tinkering reforms that Blair did manage to do, apart from all the terrible things he did as well, like PFI. All those things were based on debt. It was based on 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 um, on uh, massive debt payments. Um, what's the word? I can't get the word. Uns un un unsustainable debt, unsustainable borrowing, both individual people and government. Um, and, and also this, the, the stock market boom and all the profits that came from financialization, all the profits from the Big Bang, all the profits you get in from, from all the kind of uh, the, the internet bubbles. And of course, that all just crashed. So now you've got a situation where, okay, the left has lost control of the Labour Party. And truthfully, it was a miracle we ever got control of the Labour Party, in truth. It was a bit of an accident. So let's just, we just write it, off, write it off as a win and then a loss, you know? So, okay, we're, we're back where we were. We, but we're not right back where we were because the left is so strong. I mean, you've got this now, you've got Navarra, you've got in America, you've got Jacobin. I mean, there, there's a whole generation now of young people that are coming towards um, socialist ideas. There, there's a, they're, they're the left in trade unions, the left in the Labour Party is immeasurably stronger than it was for the last 20 years or so. Uh, and I'm really hopeful, you know, we just kept, we keep on fighting, don't we? We just keep going. As, as my mate Joe Solo says, we fight till they lose. We love Joe Solo. I've interviewed uh, I've interviewed Joe on here, and he actually wrote, he wrote the jingle for our show. So um, he's a diamond. That, he's, he's a diamond. Little red he's, flag. We 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 have little sparring matches about the Labour Party, but you know he's a diamond, and he says, you know, we, I choose to fight till they lose, and that's what I do. You know, and I think, you know, you got you got old codgers like me, and then you have got like youngsters. I mean, you're quite unusual to be in that sort of middling time. I mean, you're you're supposed to be still mm -hmm. a youngster. You're a bit of a youngster. No, I, I think people think I'm younger than I am, um, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but, but there was a gap, there's, there's, a gap. In the middle. There's, a, there's the 90s and noughties gap, uh, but they, so the left in now is like lots of old codgers and, and then you've got a whole generation of people coming through and thank God they are and, and they're good, they're learning, they're having to learn lots quickly, you know, and they've been through the Corbyn thing and think, well, okay, that didn't quite work, why didn't that work, what can we do next time, and that's, that's very good and the people are thinking, and there's there's been a, like a you got socialist websites and, and stuff popping up like mushrooms all over the place and it's just good there's a ferment of ideas um and this is just part of it just me giving you the interview you know it's just part of it and it's just lovely to see that's exactly uh, how we feel like we we feel like we're part of something and we always uh, try to help out other left websites left media and stuff because it's going to have to be that that um you know that collaborative effort where you you work collaboratively but in your own little groups i think um so you you've had a really positive message there really hopeful message towards the end and that's how we always like to to end the interviews we always like to end it on something hopeful i'm going to ask you one further question on that then so you've spoken about why there's hope there so mm -hmm. how do we how do you think that we could do some something to change everything so with what we have now how do we do it are we doing the right things or, or is there something more we can do or anything from your own experiences my experience is that um it's like you like call there's like a little mole you, when you think everything's quiet it sometimes isn't you know i mean I think a lot of the a lot of the young people that experienced the crash of two thousand eight, they didn't immediately get involved in stuff. They just kind of 
they mulled it over for a few years. They just became more and more angry and more bitter as the years go on. And that all kind of exploded into the Corbyn thing, you know, and it had gone into like Occupy and, and the student uh, revolt earlier on in the sort of 2011 time as well. Um, and I think, you know, you think, you think workers, working people, I think workers like, you know, the broad working class, white collar, black work, black workers, gay workers, straight workers, women workers, the whole caboodle, trans workers. You know, I think they're all just kind of mulling it over now. OK, what do we do? And I think they will move. But, and our job, I think, is to just orientate ourselves to that, you know. So I don't, there's no point, I think, actually just... There's no point just flouncing out of the Labour Party in that sense. I know I don't want to disrespect people who've taken a decision. I know Joe has, you know, it does not being called flouncing. But I don't think I would leave as an individual for the Labour Party. I don't think that's the time to do it. That's a debate you can have. I, I respect people who don't agree with me, but that's my view. Um, I wouldn't leave a trade union if it was bad either. You know, you know, your trade union can be bad, but you're still, you're still part of it. And I think what will happen is over the, the next few years, people are, they're bound to, to fight back in their own way. And I think rather than trying to work inside just the Labour Party, I think we have to orientate ourselves to, because, you know, you can win that resolution or that resolution in this conference or that conference, and it's not going to change the world either way, truthfully. It's important to do, and we'll carry on doing it. But if there's an absolute social ferment, if there's massive kind of fightbacks and, 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 and fightbacks by working people against the attacks that are coming, well, then that gives us something to work with. And then we need to take part in it. I think we need to prepare ourselves for that, educate ourselves, discuss it through, do as much work as we can, whatever limited resources you've got, sort of building up industrial struggles. Because I think struggles on in industrial plane and struggles in communities, sometimes the Black Lives Matter. The Black Lives Matter, where did that come from? That came up overnight like mushrooms. All of a sudden, it was nothing. And then every American city is in flames and, and all over the world, people are taking the knee. You think, what? Where did that come from? Who, come on, who predicted that in January last year? No one. You know, stuff just happens. You know, people are sitting at home and you think they're, they're apathetic, but they're actually mulling it over. And eventually something happens and they go, no, I'm not accepting this. I'm not accepting this. And they, and they, they, they fight back. And as a left, we have to be prepared for that, to catch them, you know, because if we don't, they'll go to the right. That's the problem. Um, and we have to be, we have to prepare ourselves to stopping that drift to the right, because the right are just loving it. They, they're preparing to sort of get into communities, working class communities, and they, they go for that. Not so much in big cities, because they're so multiracial, I think it's hard for the right to get any kind of hearing. But in, in, in whiter working class communities, the right are kind of pushing and pushing and pushing. <laughs> And we need to make sure we uh, we try and stamp on that. But yeah, we just we, we, we fight till they lose. I, mean, I think more political change will come by people actually fighting back in workplaces and communities. And that will have an effect on the Labour Party. The Labour Party will have to respond to that rather than just having a kind of, you know, a vote in endless committees inside the Labour Party, which is you need to do it, but it's not the end of it all. You know, does that make any sense? That makes perfect sense. That's a tremendous answer, and uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ray. So, if, if we see ourselves as like little fish, we need we need like a, a river to swim in. So, we we need a the, the river is like working class kind of fight back, and then we can swim in that river and see and see where we go and see we can, we can we can affect that and and have some change on it and 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 win people to our ideas. And I think we can. And I don't think the ideas of the soggy centre Guardianistas will have any appeal to anybody. They won't appeal to workers of any color, sexuality or gender or anything that, you know, they've got nothing. Because I just to finish with a funny story. I mean, you know, all this stuff about, oh, well, we like gay people. It's all, whenever the sort of centrists talk about gay people, as if all we are, all we are is, uh, is our sexuality. Like all we do is, is have sex all day. I God, I wish that were true. You know, there's this, this, this idea somehow that, that, that gay people don't need houses or schools or hospitals or, or, or transport system or decent wages or trade union rights, you know, that somehow we are defined by, by, by our constant need for sex. <clears throat> and it's just ridiculous. I mean, we're just ordinary people. Um, and I think, you know, the, the idea, you'll win, you'll win gay people like you win everybody else by, by offering a proper economic alternative to this appalling, 
injustice of their system. Um, but when you're doing that, you have to also take up their specific gay related questions, you know, but just going for their sexuality. Well, then, OK. Oh, fine. So you, you think I'm you think I'm valid, but I'm still unemployed and homeless and uh, and, and, and my, my local hospital is crumbling. You know, who gains from that? It's a really good story to end on. So thank you so much for coming on, Ray. Um, I've got all of it, welcome sorry. On. Oh, no, it was absolutely superb. I thoroughly enjoyed it. And I'm sure our, our viewers will as well. Um, so we'd like to thank you for coming on Socialist Think Tank. You'll always be welcome. You'll always be a friend of the, of the show. And uh, we hope to see you again sometime. We'll keep the red flag flying here.